I, I personally, you know, uh, serving here in Mountain Home for right at 20 years now, um, I've come to really enjoy the, the seasons and the transition. You know, as you come into summer, you're kind of looking forward to some change of routine a little bit, you know, and then being able to get out, do things outdoors, enjoy the culture, enjoy what we love. And then uh, I also really look forward to coming back together in the fall, which is ultimately what happens many times. You know, um, people come back many times um, exhausted, <laughs> uh, spiritually hungry, and it's always good to serve food to hungry people, right? That's kind of what I figure, so especially when we're digging into the Word. So, um, as mentioned, the step-by-step, -step, which is our midweek um, study through the Bible, is going to begin, in, begin September 18th. And I'm looking forward to it. We're going to adjust our format. We do some things a little different, um, just realizing some of the changes in culture and various things and trying to find a way to connect. We're going to begin, not next weekend, uh, the following week, I think I'll have to check my calendar. We're going to begin the, the letter to the Romans. If you haven't read it, it's a great book to start digging into and... Uh, it's a very encouraging, intimidating, um, scary, joyful book all at the same time. That's just chapter one. So it's really good. I encourage you to start digging in. So on Wednesday night, we'll uh, be going verse by verse through Romans as we touch on various uh, passages and topics within the chapter on Sunday. We'll then continue that chapter on Wednesday night. It's a great way to study together, a great way to grow in the Word. I know we all have a need to grow in the Word have a greater understanding of God's grace and His love, and that's just one of the ways that that can be accomplished. Um, in order for that to work, as the announcement said, we will provide, uh, well, we don't provide, we try to make available um, children's ministry, as we call it, you know, uh, something for the kids. But we do need people with that passion, that heart, that desire to provide um, lessons to be able, we, we provide, quote, the lessons, but the teachers and those helping and serving would come in and and just share and serve our children, you know, in that way, because it's also a great way for our kids to uh, have that spiritual nourishment during the week as well. So if you'd like to be involved in that, uh, if that's where your passion, your heart, your desire, you'd like to serve in some capacity in that way, then just, as mentioned, fill out the response cards that are there in the back. Those cards list other ways you can get involved, as the video mentioned. So um, ultimately, and we're going to look at it today, um, getting involved is a way that we serve. It's a way that we take what um, we've learned, what we've experienced, what we've received, and we let it grow in others. You know, and ultimately what happens is it grows within you as well. You know? Otherwise, what we've received, if we don't have some way for that to flow from us, then it, 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 we, we, it, it kind of stagnates within us as well. It's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, many of you know what I'm talking about. It, 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 when we receive that knowledge of God's grace, the example of His servanthood, the, the, just, the truth of the gospel working out in us, we really need, it's got to flow, it's got to go in order for it to grow. It's, kind of, it's fascinating really to me because it seems like if, if it goes out, it drains you. But it isn't, that's not how it works. It's kind of like a, the difference between a stream and a stagnant pond. One of them has flow. One of them's just got algae. <laughs> you know, one of them's green and you ain't getting in and one of them is refreshing. So anyway, just be really praying through. We're gonna, you know, today I'm going to be looking... That Jesus model, Jesus teaching, his example, and we're going to see some things in relation to getting involved, servanthood and such. So, but first, let's pray. Let's pray for the offering. Um, thanks. Also, I want to say before I forget to everyone who helped last weekend in the church in the park, and um, it was a great time, great time to get together and everything. So, uh, thank you, and thank you for putting everything back together. It's nice to have everything back here and working again. So let's pray together. God, thank you that we have a place to gather in your name. Lord, thank you that you have provided. Lord, you've stirred our hearts individually to be responsible financially. You, you're teaching us what it means to take from what you poured into our hands and through our hands in the sense of money. You're showing us what it is to, to give and to give back to you and to um, be a part of your kingdom in a financial sense. And so thank you, Lord, that you've provided this facility. You are teaching each one of us how to give cheerfully, joyfully, not out of compulsion or coercion, because we're understanding your provision. And so thank you, Lord, that you're patient and kind, 
You don't pressure us or push us. You reveal truth to us. Lord, thank you, God. And we pray for those who are, are traveling and those who are um, able to get up with family and friends and just spend time in this world you've created. And we pray first that there would be opportunities for your light to shine forth from your people to the people around us, Lord. That there would be a curiosity, a hunger, an interest in the love that you've placed within us, that it would be shining forth to those around us, Lord God. And so we pray that that would take place today and tomorrow, Lord, and throughout this, this life, Lord. We pray for those who would travel, Lord. We pray for safety on the highways. We pray for great conversation between husband and wife and children, Lord, on the road trip. There may be times where just be sweet engagement, Lord, and conversation. God, thank you. Lord, we just pray you teach us your word, teach us your ways, show us what it means to live for you, guard our hearts from any facade or pretension or form of religion. Teach us about this life you've given us, God. And so, Lord, even today as we look into your word, we believe you're, you're the one who will walk us through. You're, you're the one who will speak to our hearts, oh God. So, Lord, I pray you use my mouth, my voice, my presence, Lord, not uh, in any way to be a distraction, but Lord, you bring truth through me and to me, Lord God. May we be shaped and formed by your presence for your glory and our joy. We ask these things, Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right. Well, we have been doing a series, so to speak, over the summer, and we've been looking at Jesus' model and example for teaching. Not just, you know, how did he present things in the sense of sermon style. We have glanced at that. But we've looked at his presentation of truths, how he presented them. You know, some of it was very, like, matter of fact. Some of it was very opportunistic, so to speak. It seemed to be somewhat spontaneous in the way that he was traveling with the disciples and he just took the opportunity to present a truth, a parable style, so to speak. Lay in a natural truth, he would show them through that natural truth, the spiritual truth they needed to know. We've looked at his uh, lifestyle teaching. In other words, as he's presented truth and he's shown them things that were very uh, radical, really. When he overturned the tables, it wasn't just disruptive. That, that can be easily fixed. You know, you, you get new doves and you pick up the coins, no big deal. That wasn't the problem. The problem was what he showed them about interfering with religion and breaking up systems. And it was very, like, crazy. I mean, it was a crazy scene when he did that. We've seen other things where he, when he presented love and he showed people what love really looks like. We're going to look today at his model, if you would, his message, and even his motive in regards to serving. Serving is, I think, one of the most confusing things in our culture. So, title of today's message, <laughs> you've been served. So, because in reality, the truth beyond some legal document distributed, there's something much deeper for us to understand that God has actually served humanity. And God has created in us, He has designed the human experience around servanthood. See, the joy in serving, it even seems like an oxymoron, like a contradiction. How can that always be joyful, this thing you call serving? But ultimately, just this, this, this think realistically. Parents experience the joy of serving. From the moment of conception, it's God's design that both parents learn more about serving. Agreed? I mean, just think about that. When the husband's told by the wife, I'm pregnant. You know, after the initial shock, after the initial, like, okay, we'll adjust. Okay, oh, all right, that's awesome. But then there's this working through. What am I going to do? How are we going to pay the bills? How we, all this is, like, internal, and it's not just the guy. They're working through, because ultimately, what are they learning to do? Change priorities, change schedules, change sleep cycles, whatever's going to be, because the serving, they're learning, there's an opportunity. Don't get me wrong. I don't, I'm not saying that because a child, someone knows there's a child to be born and all of a sudden they're servants. Not true. But we're given the opportunity to know more about serving. 
So it's really simple. I don't think we usually think of it that way. And the whole life experience really is about servanthood. Children experience it. They're the recipients of parental service. Contrary to their belief, the parents are actually serving them, right? Most kids don't go, thanks for serving me. I really appreciate it. Not even the little guys, you know, definitely not the older guys. The older they get, the more it seems like, yeah, there's a servant here. It's called me, teenager, and I mow the lawn. I understand this servanthood thing. I'm your slave till I get old enough to move out. And it's a weird concept. Our culture really, and it's not just like American or Western culture. It's human nature. Because deep down, we're more self-minded than we want to admit. And God has made us. He's, he's made this whole thing to, to orient around serving others. As adults, we serve others. You're single, married, that's, that's not the point. We serve others, neighbors, friends, family members. A servant, in this sense, is an attendant. A servant is one who helps meet the needs of another person. We have in our culture a vocation. We call it a waiter or a waitress. And it kind of is a picture. It, it's the motive we, I don't want to talk about right now. We'll deal with that later. But the picture is clear, right? You sit down, and they wait on you. They, they bring something to you, water. You, they even allow you to pre present to them a request. And so you give them your order, so to speak. And then they bring that to you. That's the picture that, that God is teaching us about what the core of, of servanthood is. It just really speaks of, of to, to wait upon another person. It also speaks of one who executes the commands of another, especially of a master or a servant, an attendant, a minister. You know, many people speak of minister. Oh, he's a minister. Like it's some religious accomplishment. You get to wear a cool collar, you get to do certain things, and certain people respect you differently. That's not really what that title is. A minister is a servant. That's all it says. It's, just, it's not meant to be a, a religious status symbol or whatever. It's an example of serving. Well, if you think about it, it it's a key in understanding life, and it's an essential, it's an essential to knowing God. We've got to understand this reality about serving. And I'll be, I'll be honest with you, I don't, I've never really made it my focal point. Okay, so to really get to get a grip on this whole living for God thing, I've got to learn what it means to serve. See, I think, I always thought more, I got to learn more what it means to deny myself. I got to learn what it means to live sacrificially. I got to learn what it means to, to, to do things that God would want me to do them. But ultimately it's simplified. And just realizing, God, teach me how to serve. Show me how to serve. Have you thought about this? Servanthood is the most common relational term Jesus used to describe his people. Really, he mentions children. And he, you know, like being a child of God and various things. But the most frequent term, if you would, I think, if you, if you dig into it, by model or by declaration, is about servanthood. About serving people. With that in mind, remember, God has served humanity. If, if servanthood means meeting the needs of another, you and I are here today, if we are Christians individually, if we're born again, born of the Spirit, it's because God has served you. God has seen a need that you have. He knows your needs before you knew you had a need. He brought to your awareness the truth of sin and the need of forgiveness before you figured it out. So he actually realized your needs served you. It's, it's powerful. It's, it's, it frees us when we realize that's how we're made, to follow his likeness, to be created in his image and likeness. He's created us to be servants. Now, that doesn't sound cool, does it, culturally? Say, hey, what, what are you, uh, what's your rank, dude? Servant? Smart aleck? Seriously, what are you? You know, people don't see that as a sense of, of, of success. They don't see it as a measure. But if you, if you think back, the people in your life who you generally speak up to, and I know there's some exceptions, but those in your career field or those that have been a positive influence in your life, most of them didn't talk about who they were. 
They just served people. They served people within their vocational requirements. They didn't talk about who they were and how they were. They just fulfilled the responsibilities with a very humble attitude. It's what drew you to them because they were leaders or they were people of integrity that lived out this, this servanthood and, and they didn't have to talk about it. So we're going to check out a, a, a passage here. We're going to look at three things today. Uh, I, want, I say it because I'm not going to break it up into a, a you know, three-part outline and, and walk through. I like that, but I'm not going to today. We're going to look at Jesus' message his model, and his motive concerning servanthood. Motive is that, why are you serving? It's a question that we actually should allow to resonate frequently in our minds and in our hearts. So with that, let's go to Mark chapter 9. A lot of passages to settle into. We're going to cover quite a few verses in the sense of content um, to, to look through really what I think is a key part in understanding this and living this out. It doesn't matter whether you're, you know, adolescent or whether you're, you know, a lot later in life. You know what I'm saying? This, this principle is essential. It's, it's, it's critical. So let's look at Mark chapter 9. We're going to begin in verse 33. In verse 33, what's been taking place is, you know, so Jesus, by quick reference, he went up on this, what called, what's called the mountain, mountain of transfiguration. And when, he, when he's up there, he, you know, this whole powerful thing takes place, study it on your own, dig into it. He comes back down off the hill. Mark's telling us about a dad who brought his son to the disciples, and the disciples couldn't heal the son. And so, you know, that powerful statement, that, that, that challenging um, statement by the father where he says to Jesus, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And it continues on, and the disciples, you know, are... are talking about things, and Jesus predicts to them, tells them, speaks prophetically about his death and the coming resurrection. And that, that's kind of how the content. But check out what's taking place in the conversation. Verse 33, when he came to Capernaum, and when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed? It speaks of disgust. What were you guys discussing among yourselves on the road? Verse 34, but they kept silent. For on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. And he sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, Whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. Let's stop right there just for a second, work through that. Do you catch what's going on? Jesus had just done a powerful thing. Not only the Mount of Transfiguration, and, and then there's healing, and then the other Gospels tells us, tell us that uh, the disciples ask him, man, why couldn't we deal with this demon thing with this kid and the dad and that whole deal? And, and Jesus was telling them about prayer and fasting. But do you catch what's going on? I mean, he just taught them about the, his pending death. He was very specific, I believe, in regards to crucifixion. And it was going to be him. And he was going to be resurrected. And it seemed to be like, huh, okay. It just kind of blew through with the disciples' brains. Okay, okay. And then what were they discussing? Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Because see, remember, in their mindset, they're not looking to him as the Messiah in the sense we would know him to be. They're seeing him as the Messiah politically, so to speak. The Messiah that would take off this Roman oppression and lead them over the Roman uh, authority that the Jewish nation would rise and he would be the leader. And of course, Jesus is the leader and he's going to need a right-hand man and a left-hand man. And so there's this thought like, well, who's going to... Who's going to be like on his left and on his right? Who's going to be the greatest? Can you imagine these guys walking along? They're disputing. And if you know much about Jewish people and, and in a lot of their culture, they're not as stoic. They're, they're more expressive emotionally. So you can imagine, here's this pretty engaging conversation. It says discussed. It says disputed. You can kind of see there was a lot of passion on why one thinks he's going to be in the position. I don't know how it went. It's typical male ego in my brain a form of competitiveness, 
But notice what happened in verse 34 after Jesus said, hey, what are you guys talking about back there? You know, I was kind of up ahead of you a little bit. I waited, you know, let you catch up. You guys should get in better shape. But nonetheless, you caught up. But what was it you were carrying on about? Notice what it says in verse 34. They kept silent. Just like that. See, it's like, what were you talking about? Peter, you want to tell us? <laughs> who's going to, um, well, we were just wondering who's going to be the greatest. I'm hoping they understood it was Jesus. That's gonna, who's going to be the greatest. Who is the greatest? And I'm hoping they had this mindset. It's like, we know you're the top dog. We know you're, because they don't get the whole savior of the world thing yet. They really see him politically. That, they won't get that until after the cross after the resurrection, and then there's this Holy Spirit moment that they understand his forgiveness and his love. But now they're just enamored, impressed, and following him. So you see, they say, um, nothing. I don't know if they ever did answer it. doesn't tell us, does he? Does it? doesn't say. And then Peter spoke up and says, yeah, my bad. We shouldn't have been doing that. No, Jesus just, hey, what are you guys talking about? You know, and notice what he does. He took a, well, first he says, you know, he called them to himself, called the 12. If anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant of all. That's why I don't think they answered. He answered the question without them telling. They never told him, well, this is what we're talking about. Oh, what are you guys talking about on the road? You guys, uh, anybody wants to be the greatest? you got to be the least. How do you know what we're talking about? Why do you ask if he already knew what's going on here? He's taking this opportunity to teach them. Listen, it's different. His kingdom, his model, his reason for coming is different than most people think. It's to serve humanity. And that's why he came. And so he's teaching them, you guys got to stop with the cultural comparison. Because it happens in every culture. There's a perception that the greatest is the one that is, has the biggest or has the most or does it this way like the world does it. And he's saying, no, that's got nothing to do with it. It's not about numerics. It's not about multiplicity. It's about obedience. It's about knowing who you are. It's about understanding you know, what God has done and who God is. And so he takes a child as a model, as an example of a reason to teach. And he sets this child in the midst of them. And he's taking him by the arms. I kind of think he's just like hugging this kid. I kind of can see him just sitting with the kid on his lap, so to speak, that type of picture. And then he says, whoever receives one of these children, these little children in my name, receives me. Oh, that's not, that's, that makes sense. I mean, Jesus loves little children. We know that. We've seen that. But understand, kids in that culture were far different than you see kids. The practical interaction, kids were more of a nuisance to most men. Well, I guess that's not so different sometimes. But anyway, for, for that culture, it was quite a bit different. And so for him to take and place a child is to listen, because he's taught him before, if you're going to make it, this is the faith you need to have. And they're looking to some other upstanding model of faith, some other you know, adult example. You go, no, here's the, unless you have this faith like a child, you cannot even enter the kingdom. And here he's saying, listen, unless you understand that my kingdom is different. His kingdom is in correlation or it, 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 it carries on. It, it's, it's according to his leadership style. It's according to the king. And the king is doing what? Serving humanity. And all his servants will do what? Serve in the same manner that the king would serve. So he's teaching them something very powerful, very essential. And when they, they're, they're, I'm sure they're kind of scratching their head because where we're going to go now, we're going to see. It wasn't a one-time thing that he thought, taught this. And I want you to be encouraged by that. He teaches you things, me things at times, and I don't get it. I think I do. I, I tell myself I do. But later he brings it up again or he teaches it again. And he brings not just a surface level of a topic or a, of a truth, but he starts taking this deeper still into a grasp and an understanding of that. So now let's move from 
Well, first, let's take a look in verse 38, because there's one other part I want to do before we jump back to the parallel. In verse 38, we're going to read through that, because see, he just got done teaching them that. And it says in verse 38, now, I believe that that indicates it wasn't after a little while. It seems to be maybe in the flow of this teaching moment. Now, John answered him saying, teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. Are you tracking with me on this one? He does not follow us, so we told him to knock it off. He doesn't follow the way we follow. He's not doing it the way we do it. We're doing it, so we told him to stop doing it. I'm so glad that that only happened in the first century, that it never happened again, right? It never took place at any other point after that. See, this is the core human thought. This is the, the, the natural reality within us, a form of competitiveness, a, a, a comparison type of mindset. It brings in division. If you read the first part of 1 Corinthians, you see it continues, and we know it continues in our day. So let's see what Jesus said in regards to this comparison. They don't do it the way we do it, so we said, stop it. John, I think, is kind of like, hey, yeah, yeah, I get it. Like, for example, somebody was doing this, we told him to quit it. So, hey, you know, we're kind of tight. But Jesus said, do not forbid him. For no one, excuse me, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, I thought that was in the wrong spot. Jesus said there in verse 39, Do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterwards speak evil of me. Catch this part. Underline this verse. For he who is not against us is on our side. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Verse 40, I think, is so powerful in the body of Christ. He who is not against us is on our side. So that's something they had to ask. John, when you told them to quit, were they against me? Well, I wouldn't say they were against you, but they didn't do it right. And Jesus would say, zip it, shut it, stop it. Are they against us? Isn't it a really interesting measure? Are they against us? Are they against the core essential teachings of Jesus Christ? Well, I wouldn't say that, but they're a little too active in their worship services. I'll tell you that much. They just bounce around too many times. Or they don't bounce around enough, you know, or whatever. It's usually oftentimes in reference to, to music or tradition. Well, we don't go to that church because, you know, they're this way. You know, I, it's interesting to hear people's description about what, how we are. Because others say that, I mean, I've heard all kinds of I mean, crazy things. I just, I'm just humored. And I don't, it doesn't bother me, really. When we first started, it did, and now I'm like, I can't stop it anyway. But people have told, said to others in the church, and, and even post, I even got the email, that we water down the gospel, we, we're seeker-friendly, we rarely teach the Word, and we only teach topics if we do. And one person said, Dan needs to know that there's other books of the, gospel than the, or the, books of, of the Bible than the Gospel of John, because we were teaching through the Gospel of John. And I'm like... I'll never win on this game. And you won't. And it doesn't bother me because those people that were saying that were not against the gospel. They might have been against me. They might have been against us. That's okay. It's not this whole text. If you look at it, Jesus is not saying they're supposed to be for you. We're supposed to be for Christ. And if, we're not, if it's, they're not against him, if they're not contrary, then I just back off. Well, what do you think? Isn't that false teaching? I don't know. I'm busy on Sunday. I don't know what they're teaching. I don't go watch some other YouTube or whatever. I just believe this is it. You know who you are, know who he is, and if someone's doing it different, let Jesus deal with it. If it's contrary to the deity of Christ, there's some that, that teach there's other gospels and other testaments and, and other ways to heaven. That's contrary to the truth of the gospel. That needs to be directed, addressed. That's different. But it's because they just do something. I mean, this is so cool because he's saying, listen, guys, don't be like the world who's looking for uniformity. Understand I'm calling you to unity. And there's a big difference. Unity is essential. Uniformity is optional. 
We don't all have to look the same and act the same. So here we got Jesus, you know, as he's presenting this, and he's saying, listen, I'll keep track of who's doing what. Even if somebody kind of slips and gets a little loopy, you know, when they do something in my name and I know why they did it, I'm, I'm going to take care of them. I'm going to reward them. And so now let's move over into another section. Bear in mind, that dialogue took place. And now here, sometime later, we find in chapter 10, as Jesus has taught various other things, you know, Mark is an abbreviated gospel in my mind, is what I refer to. Mark's target audience seems to be the Romans. It seems to be direct, concise, and to the point. Matthew and Luke get into more detail in different ways. It's beautiful to have all four gospels to, to look at together. Mark's the first one I went through. You know why I went through Mark first? Because as a young Christian, I want to go through the Bible. And someone said, you should read the Gospels. Okay. So I went to the front of my Bible, and I found which one's the shortest. And that's why I went to Mark. I'm a pretty spiritual guy. See, so I just like, you know, he's going to be to the point. I can relate to that. So here's Mark, who's just like, he, he, it's beautiful. Notice what we find in verse 35, though. James and John, this is chapter 10. The sons of Zebedee came to him, saying, Teacher, we want to do for you, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's a weird statement, but you have to understand their relationship. And he said to them, What do you want me to do for you? So there, I wonder about the pause, but then they said to him, Grant us that we may sit, one on your right hand and the other on your left, in your glory. Do you remember what we were looking at back in chapter 9? Who will be the greatest? They didn't drop it. It's still going. Verse 38, But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink the cup that I drink, and with the baptism I am baptized with, you will be baptized. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it, ha it is prepared. And when they had ten heard it, they became, began to become greatly displeased with James and John. Let me bring a little clarity. I'm going to shift into the lower portion of this chapter. But in that particular text, they say, yeah, we're able to. And Jesus agrees. They're, they're able to be baptized with the same baptism he's baptized with. It's not the sacrificial baptism that we see from the Savior. I believe what he's referring to here is the baptism of suffering. So they will go through suffering. They will suffer as his disciples. And more than they even, they, they wouldn't even be able at this point to imagine what he's going to go through as the suffering Savior, nor what he would empower, enable, and lead them through as his followers. And so here they're able to go through, yeah, okay. And, and he doesn't contradict them. He said, but you don't, it's not mine to distribute. As Savior, he, he, he always, interesting, he always says the Father has appointed, or he's set certain things. So he's kind of, in a sense, teaching him not to play the relationship card. Well, let's pick it up in verse 42. Jesus called them to himself and said to them, You know that those who are considered rulers over the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones exercise authority over them? Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you shall be your servant. And whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for a ransom for many. Can you relate? Do we get the power of what he just said? Because this is our life struggle. Seriously. I believe this is true in, all, in every Christian. The life struggle is learning how to serve without getting attention. Learning how to serve as a genuine servant because you serve the Lord. Learning how to do that in His power and His strength. Every Christian I've ever talked to, this is a struggle. This is a reality. Sometimes it's got its roots deeper, but, but other times there seems to be some freedom. But it's always a, a struggle. Because there's this old nature, this old, what we call the, the flesh, the natural man, is always button heads with the spiritual man. The Bible says that they're, they're at enmity against each other. The natural man is always wanting to get attention, always wanting to notice, always wanting to, to, to be recognized for service. But Jesus says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you've got to be the least. What was his example of that? 
One of them, many of them, the whole New Testament, as you guys chew on this this week, you're going to see more and more, this is the core of the gospel in a practical expression. One of his examples is when he washes the feet of the disciples. He washes their feet, and first they say, nope. No, because that was a lowly task kept for the lowest of people, lowest of servants even, that you would have to do the dirty work. But he sits before his disciples and begins to wash their feet. And they're freaking out about it. You remember the story? They're like, no, why would that be such a big deal? You know, well, here's why. Because it's a task that was beneath them in their, in their perception of greatness. And he says, unless you're, you can see, understand that this is, this is servanthood. Notice he says, whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. Be willing to serve all. I want to break it down with the time I have left with the three things I mentioned. His message. We see here in verse 45. What is his message? The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. It's a summarization of the Savior's work. What did he come for? To serve humanity. To free. To, to, he brought to those who had need a, a solution to a need they couldn't solve. He met their need because they deserved it? No. Was there anything about them that we would say, yeah, okay, I can understand why he would do that? No. There's nothing that we could look at in humanity and justify the brutality of the cross and somebody laying their life down just to, to meet the needs of someone else. It just doesn't work out. It's a model of servanthood. This is a message. I have shown you this. This is, this is why I've came. What's his model? Not only that action of the cross, but what's his practical model of servanthood? What does it mean when he, he goes to the least of these? Do you remember the Samaritan story? The good Samaritan? Why did he share that story? Because Samaritans, those from Samaria, were considered half-breeds. They were considered lower. And so he gives this story about a good Samaritan, someone who's lower, actually serving somebody who has a need. And so it, it shocked them, or it rocked them, because he's teaching them, listen, what about the woman at the well? You know, in that culture, for him to engage with a woman at the well, a woman who he knew had been married like four or five times, and the, woman, the man that she was currently with wasn't her husband, so he knew all about her. But he engaged with her. He served her. He didn't separate it. He served the sinners. That was his reputation. You know, well, actually, he didn't really have a reputation of being singular. He, 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 had, he had, you know, no reputation, meaning... He would hang out with sinners. He would hang out with Pharisees. He would be, there was no group that was his. You know what I mean? He would had no, no like complete uh, loyalty, if you would. But he would hang out with sinners. The religious. He engaged, as we seen last week, with Nicodemus, a, a Pharisee, a, a leader of the Jews. He engaged with the self-righteous, with the purpose of serving, not to prove them wrong, but to serve them. He engaged with the poor, with the broken with the hurting, with what the world calls castaways. So by application, we want to then think, well, who do I serve? Am I willing to serve? Is there someone I won't serve? See, sometimes we're honest enough with ourselves to admit we'd rather serve this person or that person or that group or that type. But when we admit that we'd rather express our service in that way, then we're challenged because we realize the reason is I get credit for it. I get acknowledgement. I get some sense of notoriety, which is kind of then challenging when we see Jesus teaching and his example. So not only do we see the message he came to serve, a servant is not greater than his master. That's what Jesus said. So in other words, he served this way. And so likewise, we're to serve. That's the message. The model was to whoever he would lead you to. What was the motive? Love. Love. Always. God didn't love people as he came as a man and seen their plight or their condition. He loved humanity before he made humanity. It's powerful. It's amazing to stop and think, wait a minute. He, he, he did all this knowing every part of it and still chose to come and, and reconcile the world to himself. Before the world was, 
here in this life and forever in the world to come. His motive is love. And that's so important that you and I individually, privately, yet before the Lord, we, we check our motives. In regards to serving, it's good to ask, why am I serving, Lord? Keep the, keep the, keep the relationship there. Why am I serving, Lord? And I allow the Holy Spirit, I ask the Holy Spirit, search me and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, if you find something I can't figure out and it's whacked, fix it. Reveal it that I could repent from it. You, God, do the searching. Why, do, why am I serving? What's my motive? But it's also necessary to ask yourself, and I believe this is more to myself, why am I not serving? Why am I not serving in some way? Why am I not meeting the needs in some manner? Why am I not active, in a, in a sense, in the work of the gospel? It's important to ask that. And I ask myself first, because it's easier to get an answer. Well, because, you know, the pastor never asked you to. Uh, well, because they, you know, you, you said you would and they didn't call you. Well, you know, I'm not called for that. I'm not gifted in that area. I'm not sure what my, my calling is. You ever struggle with that one? I don't know where to serve because I don't know my gifting. Here, here's the thing. And I hope I can work through this without too much complication. We're instructed to serve and we are invited to utilize our specific gifts when we serve. So some would say, I don't know what my gifting is, so I'm going to wait until I figure that out. You'll never figure it out. You'll never know it. You'll always wonder. You'll always ponder. Because serving is instruction. In other words, we're instructed to serve. That's his model when we call him Lord. That's his example. We see his message, his method, his motive. So that's what he shows us. And our, our gifting is, is, is verified, clarified as we serve. I think there's an error when we disengage or fail to serve because we're not sure of our calling. I'm not sure where God has gifted me. I'm not sure of my calling, we may say. Here's the thing. You are created to serve. As I started just looking at the human experience, even outside of spiritual birth, just human experience, it's about serving. You were created to serve. When you were born again, you received your primary, your, the, the primary, the, the preeminent calling. And that is to love Jesus by the way you live. Your calling, my calling, is to love the one I call my Lord and to love him by the way I live. So my primary calling is to follow him. My primary calling is to serve him. They, they, they're all together. Does that make sense? It's not three different things. It's the way I live. It's how we're to, to live out this love we've been given is to serve him. And how you do it is centered around what he's teaching you from his word. And ultimately, as you serve him, you'll discover his gifts within you. I really believe that. And when we pull back or, dis, or unplug or disconnect, it sounds logical. It sounds schedule-based. It sounds okay. But what we start finding is we become more self-oriented and less Savior-oriented. No Christian would say, well, I'm more self-oriented than Savior-oriented. It just, you wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say that. I would, might do it. I might be more self-oriented than Savior-oriented, but I'm not going to agree with that. It doesn't sound good. But eventually, I'm going to have to agree with it. Eventually, I'm going to take that road out to where I'll see it for what it is. And then we're told to just own it, to admit it and say, Lord, I, I'm more me oriented than you oriented help me to know how to serve i believe the challenge is most of us want somebody to tell us what to do it's kind of weird for americans to even think that way but ultimately could you just show me where i can plug in and get something done i can do it i would love i could do that for you i, I really could i got a long list but i feel when i do that i sense when i do that i'm being disobedient to my calling because my job is not to plug people in and give them a list of where to serve it's to help them to know their calling and to grow in their calling. And to know your calling, it requires that we initially step out in serving. So I've seen people start in children's ministry and serving because there's a need there. And so they get plugged in. It's not their calling. So as they start there, they get their feet wet, so to speak. But they realize that's just not my deal. And I don't think that's self-minded. That's just truthful. 
And then they end up plugging in somewhere else. And sometimes it's several different places where they're kind of, okay, Lord, how do I serve? Who do I serve? How's this work out? How do I extend this love to you? And so eventually we see they just get it. And others, man, from the time they get started, they have a sense of this is my deal. This is my thing. This is how I sacrificially serve the Lord. This is how I live out the love I've been given. And you, you see them starting, in, the, in a sense, in the right spot. Does it matter which way you end up getting to the right spot? It really doesn't. Because when you're exercising this gifting, this enabling, this equipping, his work in you, coming through you, you're always dependent upon him. You're always dependent upon him. Okay, well, show me how to do this. Show me how to serve this way. Show me how to live this way. So as you discover the gifts, just remember his example. It, it's not as complicated as we want to make it, really. It's not. It's really not. Are you born again? Then do you serve? Not, not do you serve me? Do you serve the pastor? Whatever. Do you serve? And you don't want to say yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You just want to say, I don't know, do I? Lord, how would I serve you? I don't want to just fill a slot or plug a gap or start something new. Lord, how do I serve you? How do I take what you modeled and pour it into the community? How do I pour it into my family? How do I live it out in the church? How do I live, live this reality of the human experience with a servanthood? See, did you come here today thinking, you know, the thing I realized is the, mo the, 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 the truth of human experience is servanthood. I've never thought that way. I, I, have to, I have to study the word to see that. It will never come to me like, you know what? You should just serve someone. No. What naturally will come to me is like, you should go do what you want. You should go boating. You should go this. You could show that. You could do this. You work hard. You deserve it. See, it's supernatural to even consider this concept. That's why it's so deep. I think you, if you look at Scripture and you see, like, I'm enjoying myself. It just, man, it's such a beautiful picture for our life expression to learn how to serve, to learn how to just know his love and let it flow through you. It's so liberating. It frees you from so many things and we grow so much. So I'm going to park it right there. Time says we should. And we are going to take communion and communion likewise in this topic and study of serving is Jesus teaching. This is servanthood. I've given my body for you. I've given my, my blood for you. What he is teaching his, his disciples, even before the cross, was that he was going to lay down his life that they could be forgiven, that they could have life. What a powerful expression of servanthood. He's just going to do that. And of course, he wants them to remember him in the sense of it, it's not just a religious thing. It's not just some detached thing. It's a relational thing. He didn't say, you know... I'm going to lay down my life, and I'm going to, my blood will be poured out, and I want you to, to study that doctrine, to know that principle, to see that hidden in the Old Testament too. No, what he said was what? As often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me, that relational element that is so essential to, to truly know life. So why don't we stand together? We'll pray. We'll join together in a song of worship. During that song, if you as a Christian desire to take communion, we've got the elements on the side and in the back that you can come up during that song, pick them up, and then I'll come back up to close with the song together and uh, we'll, we'll take communion together. Let's pray. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for time today, Lord. You know our bodies are tired. It's sometimes hard to kind of be alert, but you speak to our heart. You awaken our soul. You have illuminated your heart from the scripture. You're teaching us day by day what it means to know you as the servant of humanity and the savior of the world. You're teaching us day by day what it means to serve, to know your design for our lives. And so God, may you just continue to clarify, continue to teach us. Thank you for your faithfulness, Jesus. We rejoice in what you've done. We rejoice in what you've given to us in this life. So, Lord, we sing to you with joy and gladness. Amen.